says finish. Does it say live? Oh, live, yes. Hey, okay. we are live. Hey, this We're is live. Patrick Milliken, oh. and uh, it is a real treat and, a, and an honor to have uh, Ivy Pachoda here with us today. On, did I pronounce the last name correctly? No. I'm so sorry. I should have told we you. Should've, I always told we should. It's my fault entirely. It's Pakoda. The H is silent. Pakoda. Now I feel like a, a complete moron. Let's start no, over. No, don't, don't. Literally, someone emailed me from Poland the other day with the same last name and pronounces it like you did. So. Pachoda. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a real <laughs> treat to uh, to welcome Ivy Pakoda. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for her uh, virtual book launch, we were just talking a little bit before we got started about. Uh, just the bizarre, surreal kind of times that we're in right now. Um, but in some ways, it's really, it's really great that we get to do it, you know, in, at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to say, it's a real bummer because when you write a book, I mean, for me, it, you, it's your victory lap to go on the book tour. Sure. But I feel like I did a, like a while ago, I did an event more at the bar and there's like 500 people in the audience online. And when I do more at the bar in person, there's like, 15 to 30 people so you know it has its benefits yeah exactly well, let me give you the, the good old formal introduction because you certainly deserve it ivy pakoda okay. is the author of the critically acclaimed novels wonder valley visitation street and these women wonder valley won the 2018 strand critics award for best novel and was a finalist for the los angeles times book prize <clears throat> excuse me and le grand prix i'm gonna blow this uh de literateur yeah. American, <laughs> close enough, as well as being chosen as an NPR and Los Angeles Times Book of the Year. Uh, Visitation Street won the pre Paje Americana. I think it's just Paj. Paj. <laughs> I know Spanish. Uh, yeah. In France, and was chosen as Amazon Best Book of the Month, Amazon Best Book of 2013, and a Barnes and Noble Discover Great New Writers selection. Her books have been translated into five languages thus far. Uh, her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. Uh, her first novel, The Art of Disappearing, was published by St. Martin's Press in 2009. Uh, she teaches creative writing at the Studio 526 Skid Row. And also, uh, as Ivy Clare, she is the co-author with the, the sadly late uh, Kobe Bryant of uh, Young Adult, uh, Middle Grade or Young Adult, would you say? Um, hmm. <laughs> it's like a middle grade book, but um, it reads up. We'll put it, it's a middle grade book that reads up. All right. Called Epoca, the Tree of Ekroth. Is that close enough? I'm just blowing it. Depends you ask. Um, I say Epoca, the Tree of Ekroth. Kobe said Epoca, the Tree of Ekroth. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> and when we did an event, did events together, it was funny. You know, we had two right. Things. Well, it sure, it sure is a treat to have you here today. Um, I was telling yeah. you how just how much, uh, I mean, I've always been a, a fan of your work since the very beginning. I remember, was it, wasn't it Dennis Lehane kind of launching his first, imp you, were you the first book in his imprint? No, I'm the second book, his imprint, Attica Locks, uh, The that's, Cutting Season. That's the right. I'm the second book, but also the last book. <laughs> <So> <laughs> well, I remember. Attica and I are the only two people he published. <laughs> well, hey, it's a good stable. Um, but I remember, you know, when that first book first came out saying, wow, what a talented, uh, you know, talented new writer. Um, and I've, you know, been following your work ever since really closely um, and loved Wonder Valley. But I got to say this new book, um, These Women, for everybody that's out there, I, I think that this is a major contribution to the literature of Los Angeles. And I really do. I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's a book that really needs to be read. Um, and there's so much to talk about with the book. Uh, can you kind of give a basic introduction to the book and, and kind of what inspired you to write it? And then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of, the, of it. Yeah, so um, it's funny, I get asked that question a lot and there are a lot of things that inspired it and I sort of have to pick and choose because I could talk forever. Um, um, initially, the thing that gave me the idea to write about this particular subject was uh, a hybrid of two things. I um, when I first moved to LA um, in 2009, the Grim Sleeper case was in the news a lot. Um, he was a serial killer who operated in South LA who um, had killed a significant amount of 15 African-American Latino 
women and young teenagers as well, young women. And uh, the police didn't really um, do their best in apprehending him or really putting any resources behind the case. Um, and then he seemed to resurface in 2008, 2009, and was apprehended, um, hence the Grim Sleeper was this, you know. Dormancy, I, when I was researching Wonder Valley, I wanted to, I, I work in Skid Row, I hear a lot of voices downtown, I'm very familiar with the patois of, you know, the streets of LA, but it never hurts to take it home with you. So I watched a documentary directed by a British documentarian named Nick Broomfield, who's made a lot of um, documentaries um, of renown. And um, I was, it was about the Grim Sleeper called Tales of the Grim Sleeper. And there's this moment in the documentary where he's interviewing friends of Lonnie Franklin's and they give the same old spiel you always get, like, you know, you, he was just a normal guy, you change your tire, and like, I love going fishing with him, no way, was he a killer? And then, you know, there's this sort of like Greek chorus of friends, and then one guy's like, well, I mean, you know, he did have all these pictures of women in his truck or his van, and they're tied up and being tortured, and you know, then there's this weird shed in his house, and I thought, this is really strange, like they knew. And also, they interviewed Lonnie Franklin's son's girlfriend who was living with him, them and she said, oh, Lonnie was very generous, but there was this weird thing about him. He'd watch us have sex or he'd watch us do this and that. And, and it became clear to me that she also knew that there was something up. Um, and it didn't seem that he was taking great pains to hide what he was up to, um, maybe not the extent of it. And I was struck by the amount of denial that must go into living with a serial killer or living in the presence of extreme violence. And um, I immediately knew that I had to write about this because Lonnie Franklin is so boring. You know, who cares? He killed people. He seemed to have gotten away with it for a long time. They apprehended him. There's nothing particularly interesting about him, right. which is the whole thing about serial killers. Like, oh, he was just the guy next door and nothing interesting about him. So, I mean, we knew that. Um, but what I was interested in is, like, the um, people around him or around a killer who are affected by the this in ways that we don't really see in fiction, be it, you know, the family members or friends or victims or friends of victims. And I thought that was a much richer story. So that was the idea. And then I served on my local neighborhood council, not very well, because I've traveled too much. Um, and uh, prostitution is a big issue in my community. And Lonnie Franklin's activities were not too far from my house, maybe 30 blocks, um, but in the same type of neighborhood. And I realized that um, this prostitution is a big like dividing point. Um, how to um, target it or change it. And uh, I think it dehumanizes the women. Um, so I was listening to these stories about, you know, prostitutes being to blame for their trade, which is not how I see it. And then I thought, I have a story. I have a community with an issue about prostitution. And I have a story I want to tell about people around a serial killer. And, you know, then I had to write a book about it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, what's, <He's> <laughs> what's interesting, um, you know, I like, I mean, I thought the title was so is so apropos in so many different ways because at first you have the flip side, which is those women, which kind of goes throughout the book as a source of condemnation or dismissal in a lot of ways. And then having the title These Women, it's almost like, yeah, fuck you, These Women, you know? <laughs> Maybe I should call it Those Women. Um, yeah. <laughs> I actually thought about that. I think that's what I meant to call it. Um, no, it is, it's funny because in talking about the book, it had a different title. It was called Western, which is the avenue that um, it's mostly set along, um, right. which is two blocks from my house. And I thought it'd be kind of cute if I had Visitation Street, which is a place, Wonder Valley is a place, and Western. And then my editor, the terrific Zach Wagman, at, well, he's no longer at Echo, um, but he said, I don't really like this title. And I kept just saying, well, it's a book about these women and these women, and I said, you know, that's a great title. And also, I mean, not to be confrontational or whatever, but there are so many books with girl or woman in the title. And I thought that it was sort of a play on that in the sense that we consume this like horror show culture. And a lot of the books are terrific. Like, don't get me wrong, and great books. But we do love this horror show culture of violence against women. Right. And I wanted to make a book about the victims of the violence. So these women just seemed really appropriate. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, I know where Western is as an artery that kind of runs all throughout the city, right? I mean, down to... Yeah, sure. Where... You know, it goes from uh, San Pedro all the way up to the Hollywood Hills. And if you know what that is, that's like maybe one of the bigger avenues in the world. You know, it's just huge. Right. And so this, in the Wiltern Theater, 
is, well, hey, Wilshire Western. I just made that connection. Hey. Um, Did you make that connection now? Because I only made that connection I just, when I went to a concert there for the first time. My husband and I were like, oh, Wilshire, we live right there. It's got a little bit of both. Yeah, I just made that connection myself. Yeah. Um, so this particular area that you're talking about, where is it in kind of in relation to to that, Wilshire and Western? Is it south? Oh, okay. Of so it, it's down south. So Wilshire okay. is um, a, close to 8th Avenue and 7th Avenue. I'm 7th Street. I'm sorry. I live on 15th Street. Okay. So um, that is, you know, going south, seven or eight blocks. Um, and the book is set, uh, my house where I live is the northernmost edge of this neighborhood called West Adams. Um, and this the story goes along western south to about 50th Street, um, where, um, you know, it's South LA, um, uh, the neighborhood it changes and we go through Jefferson Park. A lot of the people live in, in the book live in Jefferson Park, which right. is a bungalow community section of West Adams, but it runs the Western corridor. Um, Western is um, interesting because the 10 freeway, which cut my neighborhood in half, which is why it's sort of um, an interesting place to live. It used to be quite um, Tony and posh, but then the first neighborhood where they allowed non-white home ownership. So they put the 10 here because, you know, why, why should people who are not white have anything nice and let's have a freeway? Um, it's like a very Robert Moses approach to city planning. Um, but because of the 10, Western gets a lot of traffic from, you know, if you take the 10 from Phoenix, for instance, you get off in Watson County neighborhood, you just take the 10 straight from Phoenix, it goes there, I think. And then to Western and get off and you're in my neighborhood. So there's a lot of traffic um, from all over in our neighborhood. And there's that's why there's a lot of prostitution because, you know, is that the is that what's called the Santa Monica Freeway? That part of it? Yeah, it's Santa Monica. Ten is the Santa Monica. Freeway. That's what I thought. Yeah. Doesn't it go to Phoenix? It does. Yeah, it goes straight through. Yeah, to Phoenix. same road. Yeah, same job. See, I should have just driven down. <laughs> yeah, did it out in the parking lot. Um, so, uh, kind of where to begin? I mean, the book is told in various different voices and you know different chunks. Um, kind of flips back and forth between 1999 and uh, 2014 in that time period. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you about, um, let's just kind of go through the main characters real quickly and we can talk about them. I love, uh, I love how you opened the book with this character named Philia in 1999. And she was somebody who, right? Excuse me? Oh, 1999, yeah, when it opens, yes, absolutely. The book so. opens, yeah. Sorry. Um, that's okay. That's Wonder Valley. <laughs> um, and uh, she would be one of these women who barely survived, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, In many ways, yeah. you know. Um, so she was a later addition to the book. Um, I had this vision of the women, and we can't like say some of them are. That's, it's true. that's true. We can tell about what they do, and that's fine. Um, and you know who they are in the world um and so you know i'd written a few i'd written the first three sections i'd written dorian and juliana who Ju juliana dorian is a mother of a just someone who was killed on the first spate of killings and you know 15 years earlier right. and juliana is the sort of fast girl who's sort of on the verge of you know getting into a rougher line of work she's an exotic dancer she's sort of telling herself you know, a few lies about what she actually does. Um, and then I had written another, a little bit of a detective and that's not my strong suit, you know? Um, and, uh, I just needed a break from the story and this voice just, Ophelia's just, you know, wouldn't leave me alone. And it came out in the first person. And then it just seemed that, you know, I had been sort of veering away from anyone totally directly connected to this case and she's really close to it um and i really thought that she could give that sort of um you know sonic vibration of the voices on the street here um and i spent a lot of time in skid row and i listened to um the way people talk which is fascinating to me um it's very musical and very loud and has its own sort of it's almost like every, each person has their own dialect or their own way of talking um that's you know a play on words and uh i feel it was a really fun opportunity to do that but also really sort of you know you should never write a book about a theme it's a terrible idea um 
but she bears this theme like no one's listening to her and she doesn't even know what happened to her no no one listened to her to the point that they didn't tell her what happened to her you know right the, uh, these and those women are considered you know they're disposable really mm -hmm. considered disposal disposable uh, in yeah. society and they they really have no voice um you know uh let's talk a little bit about about the character dorian um okay and I'm I'm horrible about spoilers, so I'm gonna really try not to do it. And I'm glad oh, you okay. said I'm glad you said we can't talk about certain characters. It's really, really hard in this book because oh, yeah, I mean I've done a bunch of interviews and they're like we'll give it away in the first page. I'm like oh, can you maybe not say that. Um, no, but I'll we got it. Um, so Dorian is the mother. Um, she's white, and she um, has a deceased husband who is African American, and her daughter Leisha. Um, a name that I don't know where it came from um, was killed um, by this uh, killer, you know, in the first round, go round. And he was sort of, she was the last person killed that he killed before going dormant. Um, and there's some thought that it might have been a mistake to kill her. Dorian maintains she's not a prostitute. No one cares, you know, if you're killed with a bunch of prostitutes and you're not white or even half white, you know, you just get lumped in, you know with the other uh, people and she's just sort of uh you know it just sort of gave me a way dory was really hard to write by the way it was the hardest character i've ever had to write um the problem is Felia is so dynamic and juliana who follows just like it just wrote itself you know i hate, I hate it when writers say that but it just happens to be the truth like what i wrote for juliana in the first draft is what you say you know that's just except, except for some plot points but her voice the whole thing's exactly what Dorian was tricky because she's stagnant, she's frozen in time, she's grieving, and like not really doing a lot that feels organic. So if you make her do something, you know, it took me a long time to really get into her character, and it meant taking a lot away as opposed to adding more stuff and figuring out who she really was. Um, so I also named her after a woman who lives across the street from me who bought my book today, and I had to go tell her, I'm like, this has nothing to do with you. <laughs> Don't worry. I was going to ask you about the name. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, I was looking out the window and I saw my neighbor Dorian, who's fantastic, a casting agent, and I thought, I love that name. You know, it's a great name. Um, but then she wrote me an email saying she bought the book. I said, there's something we need to discuss. I was I was struggling to find an Oscar Wilde connection throughout the whole book, and I was like, nah, it's just not happening. I wanted a slightly androgynous name. I don't know why. I thought that would be important. I don't know why that appealed to me. I, you know, I, I had a writing instructor in um, graduate school named Alice Madison, who was instrumental in many lessons, many simple lessons. And she said, always name your character something that stands out, but not too much. Because, you you know, if everyone's saying Mike or Mark, or, well, you know, Mike, Mark, whatever, whatever, whatever. But, um, you know, I try to give my characters names that are easy to pronounce, but that, that are distinct from other people. Right. And so Dorian, um, you know, she runs a, a fish, what is it, the fish shack? Uh, fish, the RNC fish, fish shack. Yeah, um, which has kind of become a, a neighborhood institution, really. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, and she really the thing is, is that um, you know you said she's kind of you know this stasis kind of thing. Um, yet, you know she's she takes real pride in her food, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know she she uh, feeds a lot of the neighborhood women at the back door yeah, yeah. can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that is was that sure. a place based upon um was it inspired by a real place not that far not a place that feeds prostitutes on the stroll um yes it's a hybrid of two places in west adams and well, in jefferson park one is a belize physically it's based on this belizean fish restaurant that's just great you know like like a lot of things in la I guess after Rodney King, they put riot gates and bars up so you can't tell what's inside. And the Belizean Fish Shack doesn't look like anywhere you need to go. And it's this amazing community um, meeting point where whoever, the people who run it, they cook sort of Belizean home cooking. Um, I mean, I didn't know too much about Belize. To be honest, I didn't know anything about Belize before. I'm from the East Coast, you know, we don't really go on vacation to Belize. People right. down here do that a little more. Um, and they make these family meals, and it's quite bare bones. Um, there's also, further down in Jefferson Park to the west, there's a place called Mel's Fish Shack, which has the type of food that Dorian serves, more sort of southern, 
um, fried fish. Um, so physically, it's like this fish shack, both a hybrid of them. Um, and these places are really important in the community. Uh, you know, when I moved to West Adams six years ago, it had it was what, it was gentrifying because obviously I moved here and I'm not the typical West Adams resident. But um, the first wave of cool like hipster restaurants hadn't arrived, and it's sort of trickling in. So places like Mel's Fish Shack and the Belizean restaurant, the Belizean Fish Place, are really really important in terms of getting good fresh food um that's not you know people are really fighting back against um, big box stores and chain restaurants so like they're really really important and they sort of are stamps that of the our neighborhood identity so i really wanted that to be part of the story you mentioned she's on the outsider, so it's weird <laughs> yeah you mentioned um there's a lot in the book about um you know kind of in the background but about the architecture of the city and about the uh you know the neighborhoods and um, you know, kind of the LA is such a shape shifting, continually kind of reinventing itself sort of landscape. You know, when you look at crime fiction in general, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things I love about it whenever I go there, um, my actually, my uh, I was born there, came here to Phoenix oh. when I was like three years old. But my uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was an LAPD cop back in the 40s and 50s. And, oh, wow, uh, yeah. And so she grew up going to all these, you know, being taken as a little kid. He was in Hollywood Station, and he would take her to all these amazing premieres and things back then. Um, and so I love going back there with her and having her show me s certain things. But um, Hollywood Station, like that's the heart of it all. Yeah, and uh, L.A. is, as I say, it's constantly kind of. They're the ghosts of the past are everywhere in LA, kind of creeping up from the from the sidewalks and in the buildings. Yeah, I'm a newcomer, obviously. I moved here. I'm from Brooklyn. Very actually, like you, I wasn't actually born in Brooklyn. I was born in Philadelphia and moved to Brooklyn when I was two and a half, but I consider myself Brooklyn born and bred. Um and uh I came to LA in about ten years ago and never thought we'd stay. You know, my husband works in the film and TV. And uh, I really don't know the city and didn't know the city well at all. And it, like, we lived in sort of odd or odd areas. And I didn't, I was so unfamiliar with the West Side. I still am a little unfamiliar with the West Side and the Hollywood Hills. But I learned a lot about, you know, the neighborhoods we lived in, like downtown and the Arts District and Skid Row. We lived adjacent to Skid Row and Boyle Heights. And then we moved here um, to West Adams. And I can drive anywhere east and south. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's gotten better. But what I realized in reading crime fiction is that crime fiction is the genre that really covers the city. And like you read Walter Mosley's Easy Rollins series, like that's the city I know, you know, um, it's South LA and, you know, Pico uh, Boulevard right. and, you know, downtown and Michael Connelly also, um, although Bosch got transferred to San Fernando, which is in the Valley, right. um, you know, he, these are books that cover an area in LA that's not really touched upon in other, and Joe Ide, uh, whose name I probably just butchered, although I'm a huge fan. <laughs> uh, you know, these are, that's a really, you know, an inspiration to want to write well about the city because yeah. crime fiction is something that really does a good job of it. Yeah, there's so many. It's funny you should mention Mosley because I just talked to him, kind of like we're talking now, about a week ago. And we got hey. into we got into this great conversation, you know, about all sorts of stuff, music, and but um, we we're talking about, you know, how or I was kind of waxing about how, uh, you know, how grand groundbreaking his Easy Rollins books really were, you know, because it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we knew we knew L.A. period L.A. from the white perspective. We right. had we had Raymond Chandler, we had Ross McDonald, and. Um, but him taking us down Central Avenue and showing us the city we thought we knew from a completely different perspective was incredible. You know? Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, I reviewed Rose Gold for the LA Times whenever it came out, maybe six years ago, and I read all of them. I read like six. I read a bunch of them, but then I had to revisit it. You know, I read about seven of his books back to back, and I felt like the plot was fascinating and Easy Rollins is fascinating, but this map he was making of LA. Um, an African American map of LA, um, it's like an indispensable cultural artifact that I, and you know, and I think Michael Connolly 
although obviously this is an African-American map, is drawing a indispensable map of Los Angeles. And I just think that crime fiction um, doesn't feel beholden to any, any sense of obligation to write about places that people know or people want to hear about, you know, expect to read about Hollywood when they hear LA or Venice or the beach. Right. You know, crime victim is where the crime is, or, but where the community is too. This crime is a really important way to investigate a community and a really great one. So like these books are, um, you know, when all is said and done and their archivists studying crime fiction of the 20th and 21st century, they will hopefully turn to the canon of Los Angeles crime writers as a way to understand the city. Yeah, and you, th you think about, um... Uh, you know, like John Fonte and uh, mm. Nathaniel West and, you know, kind of these earlier chronicles. Uh, or it's funny, just let's just talk about L.A. in general. Um, you know, there's so, there's so much to talk about, you know, the whole boom and bust economy of its past, you know. Um, and that sort of, uh, you know, dark underbelly. You know, it's, it's, it was kind of touted by boosters as being, you know, paradise and all, you know. Thousands well, yeah. and thousands of people went to Hollywood and Vine and to make their fortune. Well, it's weird because I think about this a lot because, you know, every, exactly what you said, you know, this is a sort of manifest destiny um, for a certain type of, um, you know, journeyman or someone who wants to make their fortune out here. But the problem is there's nowhere else to go when you get here. Like, there's an ocean and you're done. Right. So, yeah, so I, I think it's actually a really interesting um way to think about what happened in LA is like people came out here to follow their dreams but like and when it didn't work out they couldn't go any further west or they really can't go too much further south um and so there is this whole aspect of dreams run aground I don't mean like Hollywood dreams just like tons of different dreams and so for you know the the topography or the actual geology that the Pacific Ocean is a barrier to that you know continued sense of progress and destiny, there's a whole bunch of stagnation in LA and there's a whole bunch of despair. And I think that's one of the reasons, I mean, you know, that there is a whole bunch of crime because, you know, it's stressful and there's not a lot of opportunity when you come here and things don't work out. Um, you, I mean, obviously you can go back. I'm not saying you can't go back, but you know, when you fail on your journey out West, you know, you read about pioneers. Um, I have a five-year-old who are spending quarantine reading Little House on the Prairie, which we were doing beforehand. Um, you know, the Ing the Ingalls family keeps going west, you know, more right. wants to keep going west, right. but like right. there's a possibility that, you know, there's no more west. So there's sort of those dreams crash on the shore and sort of, you know, like a wave crashes and then that kind of unpleasant part like trickles back in. I think a lot of the LA um, noir elements are from those like wave dregs that are sort of rebounding onto the beach. Totally, yeah, and also, um... You know, it's funny, we read for our little book group here, I've been running a, a hard-boiled and noir book group for almost 20 years oh. here, and we oh. did it. We did Mildred Pierce, you know, by James mm -hmm. N. Cain. And uh, in that book, you know, which is more of the 30s, so mm -hmm. um, you, you really see that, you know, because the Depression is, has hit. And right. uh, in the background of Mildred Pierce is all this, uh, you know, suicides, you know, just despair, you know, the, the crash. Everything. Right. Yeah. And then there's also this weird occult uh, element of LSA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I to Root of Evil, you know, the Hodel family podcast. I have a feeling you've listened to this if you're very no. fond of work. No, I have never heard oh, oh, wow. Okay. So it's about the Black Dahlia murder and George Hodel, who's you know, most likely the Black Dahlia killer, and um, all the Hodel family, which is the most twisted family. As someone who's just about to come on and tell you that, like, we shouldn't fetishize serial killers. I'm like, go listen to this podcast. Yeah, right, it's really messed up. Um, but uh, it is sort of that, it has that, it really taps into that occult, um, you know, Al, not quite, like, in Pasadena, there was like Aleister Crowley and, you know, L. Ron Hubbard and all that stuff they're doing. And George Hodel and Man Ray were sort of in this occult world. Um, but also it has a lot to do with what we were just saying, the sort of refuse of like, people trying to make it didn't quite work. So there was this other level of like nefarious arts arts that is just so prevalent here, which is, you know, a huge aspect of, I think a huge influence on LA noir. Yeah, absolutely. 
And um, must listen to Fruit of Evil. It's one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. Yeah, it's funny because I. I'm, do you think the Hodel? I I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I buy it that he was the guy. Um. Yeah, I do. do you? I've never been so sure of anything in my life after listening to this. Really, really, I have it's, to. I have to listen to it. We should have another. I I was also like, oh. You know, I know a lot about this case, and I've read a lot, I've seen a lot, and, yeah. and uh, who knows, and then I was like, yeah. Because I remember. And, and one of the ways they prove it is by, like, talking about surrealism and this obsession with Man Ray and their friendship, because there's a lot about some of the stuff in that killing that is very directly influenced by Man Ray's art. Right, yeah. So, Interesting, because I remember reading the first book that he came out with, you know, about... Uh, Son, who was the the um, the son, right? Yeah, the son. And I remember well, read, I remember reading it, and I was thinking, eh, I don't know, you know. Um, it's, great. it's great. Anyway, whether or not you believe he the killer is one of them, it's it's run it's um Fauna Hodel, the real Fauna Hodel, not the second Fauna Hodel, which is another weird thing in the document. <laughs> Her daughters, um, who are um to mixed race women, which is an important part, in a one extent, um, are not professional crime people, but they do this incredible, it's a great LA story, you know, it's everything we've been talking about. I can't it's, wait, I can't wait to, to, to yeah. tune into that. Uh, that sounds great. But talking about art, this is actually, there is a segue, I know we're digressing a bit, mm -hmm. but there is a segue okay. back into the book, which is, um, okay. which is the, the, the photography. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, and again, I'm not going to spoil anything, but uh, no, no, no. Well, first, Juliana doesn't spoil anything when we talk about her photography. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about her. Let's talk so about Juliana her. is, as I said earlier, um, she's an exotic dancer, or, or she's a stripper. Like basically, she's a prostitute. You know, but she's a stripper who works at a nightclub called the Fast Rabbit, which is randomly also in like it's a fake version of a nightclub in um, it's called the. Uh, Snooty Fox. Oh, that's the Motor Lodge. Uh, anyway, um, there's the, it, 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 it's also in Rachel Kushner's The Mars Room, which is, you know, under did a different you, name. What, what did you say? Snooty Fox? Snooty Fox. The Snooty Fox, Fox is a Snooty Fox is a famous Motor Lodge um, Western. You know, oh. Hot Sheets Motel. Um, so Juliana works there as an exotic dancer, um, though she's not really an exotic dancer, and she's sort of holding on to this idea that she doesn't do what you know she actually does um because she um still has her foot in this other sense of the world and, and sense of self and that's through taking photos on her iphone um and she becomes very interested in the photography of uh larry sultan um who is a well deceased he passed away a few, a few years ago he is a photographer from los angeles or from the valley um, or somewhere in Los Angeles, um, who has taken pictures of lots of things, but he did a whole series behind the scenes on um, porn sets in the Valley and Van Nuys. Um, I am not a huge, you know, I'm not an art world aficionado, but I did edit a magazine briefly in my 20s in LA, in Amsterdam when I lived there. And it was this art magazine and we partnered with the gallery and we got the rights to publish Larry Salton's pictures and I just thought they're fantastic. Um, they're great pictures, but also the story he was telling about, you know, porn actresses behind the scenes and, you know, the um, just the quiet moments uh, between takes. And Juliana, and so a few years ago, there was a big Larry Sultan exhibit at LACMA and there were signs all over the city for it. And when the book is set, that exhibit's going on. And Juliana sees that and she obviously is like, this is not so different from what I do. Like I take pictures of my stripper friends you know, why isn't that art? I mean, I think it is, because she's a good photographer in my mind. So um, she's just sort of, the art, for her, she's trying to navigate the sense of how one person can turn her kind of world into like something that can be hung in a museum. Right. And if that's a possibility for her. Yeah, kind of art art as a means of escape from her, mm -hmm. her circumstance. Uh -oh. Yeah, wow. or just telling the story of it. You know, it is beautiful. Um, people only see things one way, which is, you know. Yeah, well, she up, and she like, she seems to have that real natural eye for the the telling <laughs> the telling the telling detail. You know, or yeah. Um, I, she's a good photographer in my mind. Like, I feel like 
had things maybe worked out differently for her, you know. Exactly. Well, we love that stuff. Vice magazine is built on it, and there's some really good photography in Vice, so, you know, she's kind of like that. Right. Um, well, it's not giving too much away to say that, uh, that her connection to Dorian and to 1999. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that a little bit. Right? Oh, for sure. We can talk about all the characters. Like, just don't say who the killer is. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> right. um, she was babysitting. No, I'm sorry. Her daughter was babysitting Juliana the night that Dorian's daughter was killed. Um, and she's babysitting her out of kindness. I mean, Juliana's family wouldn't be the kind of family that would necessarily hire a babysitter. Misha sort of noticed that Juliana was a bit neglected and was taking care of her. I didn't, in this final draft, really go into Misha's character because I didn't think it was important, but I did have a lot about who she was in earlier drafts. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, again, part of it was denied. She was not a prostitute, but Dorian was lying to herself about you know the pristine nature of her daughter. I mean, I think all parents do that. My parents certainly probably did. I don't know. Are you guys watching today? <laughs> I know they're... <laughs> Your parents are watching? They could be. Uh, they could uh, be. I think they're watching tomorrow night. Um, cause... Anyway, um, but it's true, you know. Um, so Leisha and jo Leisha, who's deceased, and Juliana are, in a way, the same person. You know, they look alike. Right. Juliana is very affected by, Dorian, by Leisha's death. The cops have accidentally showed her a picture of it, um, and she's just traumatized by it. So she, she's changing into Julia, into Alicia, but Dorian, whenever she sees her, has this almost hallucination that Juliana is becoming her daughter. Right. You know, it's just like a grief coping mechanism. Right, and um, and then uh, the cop. Um, now I'm spacing the name. Essie? Es Essie? Esmeralda. Essie. Esmeralda Perry. Right. What a great, <laughs> what a great character. You said you're not, uh, you're not, that was the weakest part you thought? Or? It was so hard. So I remember I was at the Miami Book Fair and it was the end of the book tour for Wonder Valley. I was so exhausted. I was working on this book and it's a little hard to write a book when you're on tour for another book. And Megan Abbott and I had gone there together and we were on the weird, we had the exact same schedule. And we went to the airport, and we're, we had this, we're having a beer. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I cannot write a cop. Zach Wagman, who I know isn't watching tonight, because he's got a new board, he was like, you have to have a cop. I was like, hell no, I can't write it. And Megan was like, I can't write cops or detectives or anything either. Um, but Zach had told me that, and he was right, um, if he ever tunes into one of these things, i got to say this again, <laughs> he was absolutely right that we needed a cop or someone who could, you know. So Megan was telling me, she's like, you know, I just always find it very awkward to write that, like, um, your person who has a job to, like, investigate, and though it doesn't work, I said, yeah, I can't do it either, and I'm not gonna do it, but exactly what he wants me to do it. And then I was flying back to LA, and I thought, you know, Zach was like, you have all of these characters, but if you're gonna write a novel that satisfies some conventions of the genre, because you've broken all the rest of them, like, you have somebody who can actually go between these people organically. And I thought, well, that's gonna be a cop or a reporter, and there's reasons that I don't wanna write a reporter. Um, and then I realized, well, I don't have to write about Essie. The epiphany I had after leaving Megan in the airport and saying, yeah, I agreed I wasn't gonna do this, and she wasn't gonna, we're not gonna do this, um, was that I could write a cop, but I'm not gonna write about her being a cop. I'm gonna write about whatever it is about her that satisfies the story. And that's what Zach said. If you have a female cop, a female cop talking to these, these women is going to elicit emotions and, and like depth that you're not going to get otherwise. And I thought, yo, I can't do that. Like, you know, just, and then, you know, I can't do what Michael Connelly does. He does it great. Or what Alvaro Burke does. They do this really, really well. My cop had to have a problem that was in line with this story. So I was going to write about that problem. And then I realized I was going to write about one day in her life. But then it became so much fun to write. You know, when I realized I didn't have to write about the intricacies of police work and what it's like at the station and, you know, all that stuff. And I could write about everything and circle it, like center it on 
what's wrong with Essie, then it was like a complete delight to Heron too. So there was, there was I mean, a, she's messed up. <laughs> there was some point where you, you just said, okay, I, I got this character. Yeah, I mean, it was, unfortunately, she's sort of based on someone, someone told me, don't ever tell me a story about anything. So I was like, someone told me a story about this reporter, and I was like, ooh, that's crazy. Um, that's a really sad story. Okay, I got this. Like, let me go now. <laughs> um, but, you know, I feel that there's always the story, and that's the superficial story, but what everyone's dealing with is some kind of damage or hurt, mm. and we bring that with us wherever we go. Like, we are the, you know, we are the sum of our experiences. I, I've heard it said. And um, so she is, you know, investigating this case based on some of the trauma she suffered in the past. So it, it was really, really fun to write her. Um, and Zach was absolutely right. Like, this was a person who could link these stories together organically and also bring a perspective to the table that would be otherwise, you know, missing. In the book. Well, you know, all, all, of, these, all of these women um, and characters in the book, they, they, they all just seem so real. You know, that's the thing. You know, a lot, a long, often when you read, um, you know, crime fiction, uh, even even really good stuff. You know, occasionally you'll say, "All right, so this this character is kind of out of central casting." You know, I've seen mm -hmm. this person yeah. before. I've seen, you know, um, and I imagine, you know, as a writer, sometimes you might be tempted to kind of just go down that that road. You know. I personally am not because I mean because I don't even try. Like I'm so afraid of that road. Yeah. You know, every I'm more afraid of, for me, my version of that road is like the okay, now we know who did it. You know, even in the best crime novels and my like my favorite crime novels, there's this moment where I'm like, Okay, they're gonna tell us who did it and I don't really I care because it's you know, I wanna see that the whole story added up to this person that is organically the perpetrator of the crime and it wasn't like a pull the rug out from under you and like pull all these tricks but what i care about is like how that affects all the people you know around the the crime um and that's the moment of conventionality for me like yeah. the moment of okay so it was the school gym teacher and you know they this perfectly laid in there it's absolutely perfectly articulated but I'm just like, that I didn't actually care about. And of course, that's you know, why people read crime novels, and it's why I technically should read them. But um, I care about what happened before and after and how that continues and how that poisons the world. or you know. So that's the moment where I'm like, am I going to just be like, it was him? <laughs> you know, or am I going to really figure out, figure out, like, the best crime novels are, like, Lauren Bukes does such a great job of this. Lauren Bukes, the uh, South Africa? Yeah, she's a great writer. Yeah, she's great. She's got a new novel. I can't wait to read it. But she always finds this really creative way to dispense with that issue. You know who else I, you know, I'm sure you, you probably know her stuff is um, um, Sarah Grant. I think she's a brilliant oh, writer. Oh, we went to the same high school, but Did I you? don't know her. Isn't that weird? Yeah, she's she's an incredible writer. I think. It's funny. I just picked up Infinite Blacktop today. I keep needing to read it. Like, a lot of stuff has come up in the last two years since it came out. But I just finished the new Elizabeth Hand book, which I was saying, yeah. like, copy of it it's amazing she's great too amazing that the new cast Mary book is it's phenomenal um again it has some co crime novel convention in it but there's so much around it that it doesn't matter right but Sarah yeah, exactly the same thing I'm just looking checking while we're talking to see if I have any questions oh but I do have a lot of people just uh, a lot of people just checking in saying hey I love your stuff um, hello from Minnesota. Uh, Hi, Minnesota. This is a good one. Cheers from Borrego Springs, which is an awesome place. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> How are the poppies down there in Borrego Springs this year? Exactly. So, if anybody has any questions, I'll do my best to uh, try to ask some of these. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, and let's see what time we're doing okay on time. Um, it's mm -hmm. a lot of fun talking with you uh, about all kinds That's of stuff. That's awesome. Uh, you mentioned something earlier about um, sort of the fetishization of, uh, you know, of women, uh, and also the fascination that we have with a lot, or a lot of people have with serial killers in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like 
that I think there was an interaction, and I'm probably misremembering the exact scene, but um, Dorian has with uh, with the cop, with es Esmeralda. Oh, yeah. And uh, in my mind, it was a real crucial scene in the book because she says, I don't really care about I don't really care about him, the killer, you know. Um, yeah, it's it reminded me a little bit about the you know the kind of the banality of evil, you know that. Uh, yeah, I think what Essie is telling her is like you built this guy up in your head. I mean, he did something awful to her daughter. Don't get me wrong, and it's not something that she um, in any way disparaged or belittled, but you've made him into this entity or this you know huge monster and the point is he's not he's he's a terrible person he's the guy next door you don't care about him stop thinking about him in that way you wouldn't recognize him on the train on the subway you know um he's not interesting he's not interesting and you know of course if someone kills your child they become interesting in a completely different way right. um but we have to be careful not to, just because we don't know who someone is, to ascribe to them certain aspects of, you know, intelligence or, you know, genius. Um, and, you know, once you catch this guy, we're going to remember that we don't care about him. Like, we have to dismiss him. Um, and so es Essie is very, very careful about... Well, she, she also... <laughs> The other thing that Esmeralda is it doesn't care about the, who the victim is, like, so she's towing this very interesting line between, I don't care if they're a prostitute, it doesn't make a difference to me um, if they're a prostitute, because what matters is that they were killed, that's the only thing that's important here, um, and also we don't care who this guy is, just that he killed these people, so there should be a lack of fetishization on, on both sides, that the cops shouldn't care what profession the people who've been murdered you know, are in, right. and then also they shouldn't care, like, we shouldn't build this killer up, so it's an interesting position she has, but I think it's probably a pretty, you know, basic one. She likes crosswords, too, which kind of endeared her to me. She I don't know anything about crossword puzzles. Like, I always write about things I know nothing about. I often write about musicians. I'm like, oh, damn it, I don't know anything about music. <laughs> like, but it's sort of fun. Sort of when you don't know about something, you can write about it and sort of let go. Um, as opposed to being like, I need to get this right. Um, I'm just looking at my little notes here. I'm glad I I'm glad I jotted this down. I wanted to bring this up too. One of the main things about LA and uh, uh, classic LA fiction of all kinds is the weather, you know. Um, oh, yeah. And there's this kind of sort of, in many ways, an apocalyptic landscape, you know. No one's asked me about this. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, Raymond Chandler did it amazing job with it too you know with his stories like red wind and um but in the background you got these fires up in the hills in the book uh well, yeah it's a, it's a, there's a whole weather cycle in the book yeah so um you know why the hell people live in la is sort of beyond me like the natural world is coming to get us on so many fronts and we completely live in denial of how bad it is um so the book starts in the Dorian chapters with wind. And I compressed the cycle into a few days. It's more like a four-month cycle. And by the way, since we've been on lockdown, it has been so windy here. I have a ping pong table in the backyard, so I'm very aware of the fact that like it's so windy that we can't play sometimes. And it's been that way for two months. And I don't really ever remember this happening. It's not even the Santa Anos. Anyway, um, the weather here is apocalyptic at all times. Um, almost. So in Dorian's chapter, it's windy. Um, and then wind usually starts fire. Wind is the first, is the precursor to fire. And in Juliana's chapter, the fire is just burning. And a few years ago, there were these just absolutely atrocious fires that would like turn the freeway into like a t an inferno tunnel. And people, people were commuting through that, which, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I was shocked by it. like, why would you drive through a how important is your job? Like, you can't drive through a tunnel of fire. That seems really dangerous to me. Um, and then in the Essie chapter, is sort of a lull where the weather is sort of this, this it's minor re beat. It's right? regrouping. Yeah, it's regrouping because it's going to get bad again. Yeah. And then in the Morella chapter, who's another artist in the book, she's a performance artist, 
is rain. And rain in LA, I don't know what it's like in Phoenix. I don't know if it even rains there at all. But oh, yeah. um, when it rains here, people panic. It's like the world comes to an end. Yeah. Like if you're driving on the freeway and the rain starts, everyone just stops, puts on, puts on their brakes. It's so dangerous. Um, and this is like so apocalyptic rain. And then you know, because of the fire, there's a lot of dead ground and the rain is going to make mudslides. Yep. So though that weather system passes throughout the book, um, which is one of my favorite things in the book. Um, and I'm just always overwhelmed. I, I, I'm terrified of living here in many ways um, to comfort myself right now I'm reading David Eulin's book on earthquakes because how much worse could it get? Um, and uh, I think that, you know, the natural world is trying to take LA back. Uh, you know, we live in a very tenuous relationship with nature here. Um, but, you know, those fires were really, really something. And, you know, there's danger everywhere, not just from, you know, being a woman in South LA, but also the landscape is definitely coming to get you. Have you ever read, um, have you ever read Dorothy B. Hughes's uh, remarkable book, In a Lonely Place? Yes. Oh my God. Ages ago, but of course. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's, uh, that's right up there with Chandler and, uh, you know, Joan Didion and all the, all the great LA writers. But the reason I bring it up is that there's, you know, that whole element of, you know, nature at the end of the city down to the beach and you know the whole plot kind of revolves around how you know the menacing dark canyons and you're right i mean it is unlike casts a lot of shadows like oh, the amount of sunlight we have here creates a lot of shadows and like bad things happen in the shadows and then there's also that you know that that riff about you know kind of detective fiction or crime fiction being the natural extension of the western tradition you know with the kind of the loner character you know kind of i'm um, really it's funny that you should say that because well even before the pandemic and you know even actually less so since then i've really been interested in the western as a way to examine what's you know los angeles like a modern western because there are so many aspects of like everybody for themselves here and the sort of desperation and an untamed landscape within um, a developed city, and I've been reading a lot of westerns. Um, mm. Both, my, yeah. So, what have you been reading? Uh, well, I mean, I read. Well, I reread uh, a lot of Cormac McCarthy, which is you know, some not everybody's taste. It certainly is mine. I love it. Oh, oh, good. I mean, some people like, oh god, that stuff. It's amazing. I just reread Blood Meridian, and um, you know. Um, Do you have a favorite scene in Blood Meridian? Do I have a favorite scene in Blood Meridian? Um, well, let's see. Yes, I have a lot. Well, um, I really like the scene where they just, well, I like the end, I have to say. Yeah. I really, it's, you know, it does stand, um, but I like the standoff by the well, where the judge sort of, you start to see, that's the first moment where you see the complete, um, you know, I'm, you know, nihilism of the judge, I think, when he's shooting yeah. at them and by the well and looking for cover. Um, and also the other scene I really like is when they, they go into that town in Mexico and they throw the parade for them and then they sort of get really drunk. And... What's your favorite scene? You know, there's there are many, but one of the ones, and, and I realize, sorry, your audience, you're just going to have to play along for a minute here. I, like, I, was, like, I was like trying to restrain myself there. Oh, man. Um, I love the scene early, kind of fairly early on in the book, but when um, they come across, or, or that band of Comanches uh, attacks them, and all they see are these horses coming towards them. Oh yeah. And then all, at, at once they all go up onto the horses, you know, because the, they're all. Yeah, that's great. It's they're incredible. all behind them holding. And they're and they're wearing like all this crazy stuff that they've accumulated. You know, one of them's wearing a blood spattered uh, wedding okay. veil. A wedding veil, yeah. Someone says. Oh man. I I love when they meet the weird, the, the family of, I think they're Mexican circus performers. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, I love that book. And then I re read this book that my mother recommended called Butcher's Crossing, which is, has a, a very interesting a corollary with Blood Meridian. It's about a buffalo hunt in, um, um, I don't know where. <laughs> we'll say, we'll say Montana. I, it's not Montana though. 
Uh, maybe it's Wyoming. Okay. I know it's not Montana because I said it to my friend who lived in Montana and it wasn't Montana. Um, and he, they just go, you know, this, this, they go to the buffalo hunt and they just kill 20 times as many buffalo as they can get out of this canyon. And it reminds me of that moment in Blood Meridian where he, they just start killing everything. You yeah. know, there's a moment of sort of, as a friend described to me, like, this is like the Vietnam War. Like, we're just completely in an apocalyptic war zone and we're just killing all this stuff. They kill all these cows. In Blood Meridian, they start killing cows for no reason. And there's, anyway, so I've been reading a lot of stuff like that because it just seems to suit the present moment before lockdown and, you know. Yeah, there's a there's a, a kind of a historian, but he's a little academic, but if you don't know him, his name's Edward Slotkin. Have you ever read his books about the West? No, one, I'm writing one, a, one of them has yeah. a wonderful title. It's called Regeneration Through Vi Violence. Um, he has one called Gunfighter Nation. But there are these big tomes about the West, and I think, I oh, think yeah? it would be up your alley, definitely. Oh, cool. Yeah, I feel like Western literature is a really great way to understand um, some of the some of what's going on in L.A. with, like, the sprawling tent communities. There's some, like, vigilante justice. Um, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to get back to that. You know, we're going to be, like, just the I'm kidding. I'm sorry. It's just the way I see it. Did I lose you there? Oh, yeah, sorry. for a second. Just yeah. for a second. Just gang. Well, let's see here. I think uh, just people watching, probably fewer and fewer as we nerd out on. Uh... Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fascinating. I love talking about this stuff. Um, but um, have we. Uh, we should be receiving the, the copies of these women. I don't have one to even show. I have my little ARC here. Uh, but I do. It's a beautiful book. Wait, you don't have copies? Not yet. I think you've signed them for us, and they're on their way to us. Have you? Or have you received copies and signed them yet? Um... Maybe. We'll, we'll figure <laughs> that out. In, uh... I am with you privately, because a whole bunch of books arrived at my house, and we're not sure why they're here. That could be, some of those could be ours. I'm not sure. Okay, we're going to have to go into this. Love your there's a lot of yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, oh, gosh. Okay, um, how, yeah, I will send them, I will sign them ASAP. All right, we'll get on it. But um, we'll have signed copies soon, and uh, order yourself a copy. It's a fantastic book. Um, You'll have them. I, I can sign them off on Thursday. No worries. Um, if I'm done with them. Anything uh, before we let you go, uh, what else is going on with you? Any uh, any TV or Hollywood stuff? Oh or? yeah, um, I am. I yes. So uh, big news is that Bruce Miller, the um, creator of The Handmaid's Tale, optioned these women for TV, and hopefully Hulu. I am very excited about that. I love him, but also I am a very strict stay in your lane person. I'm a writer. I'm a novelist, and you know I write books to be novels. I don't write them to be TV shows. I'm so beyond excited that they want to do that, but I also am completely happy just to write books and nothing ever happened to them, though. I feel like maybe these women's stories should be told, and for that reason, and of course it's great, but, you know, I, a lot of people write books to have TV shows or movies, but I write books to have books. But yes, that is big news was announced today in the trade, so I'm pretty excited. Awesome. Yeah. Have, have you started working on something, something new? Well, I mean... No, I have a five-year-old and I'm locked in the house teaching her math. Um, um, but I am reading all those Western books with an eye to that might be something that I do in the future. So. Wow. You're going to do a historical? I mean, Western crime novels. There's so many crimes. Yeah, there's lots of great, lots of great Western, Western, uh, we should just, touch, you know, kind of trade notes about, because I love that Ooh. particular genre too. Really? Oh, kind I of, could, okay. All yeah. fine. We do this because I could use it. All, okay, we're gonna lose everybody now. <laughs> yeah. Please don't be. Well, anyway, um, I'll go ahead and say goodbye to our Facebook audience. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye guys. Thanks. Buy the book, and I will sign it as soon as I figure out who copies these are in my house. I'm sorry to ramble so much. I know.